Welcome to Go Lurk Yourself, a podcast about playing games and streaming on the internet. My name is Crunky. I am Cherry Cake. Welcome back, Cherry. How you been? Oh, uh, wonderful. Yes, fantastic times that we live in right now. How about yourself? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, being kind of cooped up like we've, we've been has its ups and downs. And uh, when, you, when we're living our normal lives, you don't think about the downsides of, oh, you mean I get to stay home and play video games all day? Exactly. Yes, please. Yeah, but the problem with that is that when it becomes the norm, it becomes boring. Yeah, it becomes boring and like, there's something that like, because we've, at least in my life, I've always been, had a nine to five job and been busy and yeah. always have more projects and things I want to do than I have time for, yeah. that when I finally get stuck at home, I don't know how to handle the long-term <laughs> effects of it. So like, my sleep schedule has been completely hosed. Yes, um, recently found out about that. <laughs> like even last night, I, I went to bed at like... 8 p.m. Woke up yeah. at 2, watched a couple episodes of Star Trek, and then went back to sleep and slept until 8. <laughs> well, I, uh, funnily enough, this is really off topic, but um, I was up, because me and Crunk have obviously a time zone difference. Crunk is yeah. five hours behind me uh, with me living in the UK, and I was up this morning about uh, about 8 o'clock, half past 8, something like that, and I looked mm. on Discord and I was like, Crunk is playing Divinity Original Sin, and I'm like, wait, what? At oh, yeah. I, I forgot I did play that last night. I, I, I bought it like when it was new and I was like this isn't for me and then last night I'm like oh that looks really good I'm gonna give that another try <laughs> I played it for like 20 minutes like nah this is not for me uh, it's got that um, it's got that mouse driven thing you know where you um, where you click on the ground to move yes yeah yeah yeah. but because you interact with stuff with click as well they, they put in a a um, well, this is what I assume I didn't talk to anybody that developed the game or anything <laughs> but um, they put in this thing where you have to click on the ground and hold it for like maybe half a second to a second and it's just like no go i want to go and I, so i and to be fair i didn't look through all the com- the game it's got a lot of polish and i think like for people who love that genre or love the idea of playing a a slow-paced uh story story rich dungeons and dragons game like the character creator alone is very impressive so yeah. it's not any knock against the game I, it just wasn't kind of what i was looking for when i when i downloaded it mm. and so i refunded it <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I think actually now you're talking about games. We'll get into the podcast in a sec, but uh, just to catch up because me and Crunk haven't done one of these in a while. Yeah. Um, I was on Steam a couple of days ago, and I've had uh, a game called Wreckfest on my wish list uh-huh. for a long time. And it was basically like if if you remember, um, very very long time ago, there was a an, a game similar to it for the PlayStation One, which was called Destruction Derby. Okay. So it's along the same lines of that, and it was on offer, so it was like eight nine quid from from like 35 quid so i was like oh that's a bit of a bargain i ended up playing it today and <laughs> i don't like it <laughs> <laughs> isn't it funny how like yeah like I, I when i remember when i bought that game um it was i think i bought it on a sale maybe a year ago or, or maybe a little less but mm. um it was bunny ball ball who was playing it oh. and he was like it's actually pretty fun and, and it like you know, to hear him talk about it, you, you, there's there's levels where you like race on tractors, yes. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I'm like, that's cool, but it, I I wanted it to be Burnout oh. over Burnout Three, was it on the PS2? Yes, one of people, my absolute was... all time favorite games as well, Burnout. Yeah, it, it, that mode where you where it was like a puzzle game where you had to cause as much destruction as possible. Oh, the. Um, uh, oh, I've just forgotten what it was called, but yeah, I know which one it was like it has Smash a, or something. Yeah. It, why has nobody re- redone that? That was such well, an amazing mode. Yeah, there was there was talks of um, there is like a something from like the developers that did Burnout series. Um, okay, but they split off and um, ended up creating uh, like a similar game to it. But I don't think it ever really took off. Yeah, um, I remember I think, seeing like a the, yeah. was it a a GoFundMe or something like that for it? Possibly, yeah. There was something to do with like the the developer house up and um, just disbanding or something like that and they never got around to redoing it but yeah i would absolutely kill for another burnout game like that burnout yeah, paradise never really hit the spot it did the same as me when i bought it like sight unseen i'm like oh a new burnout great yeah. and i got it and i'm like it tried to be like open worldy yeah and i'm like well, who wants this in their burnout game <laughs> yeah yeah I, yeah i know what you mean and it was more focused on the racing than the actual crashes and stuff i thought yeah it was yeah the the open world part to it I, I understand why they did it, but mm. it was it was a weird way that they did it because when you, when you were driving around the, the streets, you would come across um, uh, a, a race that you could participate and press a button and you you go into the race. Well, you didn't have to do it, but I kind of like the the original setup where you just 
did the the missions one at a time and just chose which one you wanted to do. Yeah, well, I mean, what's wrong with that? Yeah. Oh, was it called Crash? I think you're right. I think it was called Crash. Yeah, but again, like, did they have that in Burnout in Paradise? Not that I ever saw. In fact, I think that's why I stopped, you know, chasing after it. Yeah. I do. You want to feel old? Go on. Burnout Paradise is getting a remaster. <laughs> For the Switch, <laughs> for the Switch and all consoles, apparently. Oh wow! It's just a re- yeah, sometimes I think these remasters are either to make a port for the Switch or to, if we're going to spend money on on anything for it, like making a Switch version, we're going to put it on all updated consoles, PS4, yeah. Xbox One, and, and uh, we'll dump that port on the Switch on the PC as well. Yeah. I don't know. I yeah. it's great for people. It was a popular game. I know lots of people love that game. It just yeah. wasn't just sort of like Divinity. It wasn't what I was looking for at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I I've been uh, so, well. Before we get it too far ahead of ourselves, let's uh, go ahead and talk about what games we've been playing. And we might this might go a little longer than normal because we, we're doing some catch up. Hence the title of the episode. Yeah. Um, and we there's been a couple of big releases that we didn't talk about, and we want to talk about them. So. Would you like to start with uh, the biggest one? Oh, if you really want me to, I can talk yeah. absolutely forever about this and so in depth as well. I absolutely well. Love I'll, this I'll pull you back from the edge if you start looking <laughs> into the, uh, the abyss. I'll, I'll start like putting pins up in my wall and making string connections to things that have absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Um, this is Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, so this was out um, back in April. Was it the tenth of April? The beginning of April, I think. Right around a month ago, so yeah. we'll just say, yeah, I don't think, it's, it's not like we're reporting on news that's coming up, so it's no. fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is old news by now. Yeah, um, if, if, if you've, um, I, I don't know how spoiler you're going to get, but if you guys want to um, miss any story beats with Final Fantasy VII Remake, we waited a month to talk about it so we could put spoilers in here, but this is your warning. I'll I'll, um, <laughs> I'll put show notes when you, uh, it looked in the show notes on your app to see when you can skip to um, after the episode, or before, right now you can pause it and skip to here if you want to miss yeah. all the Final Fantasy stuff. Just take it like a, an hour from now. An hour. <laughs> I, I don't think it'll be that long, but I'll, I'll put show notes in there for yeah, you. Yeah. Um, so c- consider this your spoiler warning. Go check. Go, go yes. check that out. And also consider that this is an, like a remake of a game that is twenty five, twenty three years old, something ridiculously old as well. So yeah, if you, if you haven't ever played or know the story of what happens in Final Fantasy Seven, just go and play it. <laughs> well, I, I think this is a rare case because they don't really hold true to the original story, right? Yeah, this um, has been a big uh, talking point in the remake, and I I can talk about that if you want, if you... Uh, no, because you go ahead at your own pace. You you haven't played this, have you? You've seen this, but you haven't played it. I've watched a good chunk of it, but no, I've not played it at all. I'm, I'm, I'm really going to... I'll be the audience's proxy who hasn't yeah. played it and just poke you with questions. Okay, well, it's probably a good enough starting point as any of it anyway but um basically at the end of the remake they have completely changed what will potentially happen in the future it's it's a, a whole um new kind of thing that we don't really know what's going to happen next and everything that leads up to that point it's such a roundabout way of simply saying that the the developers and uh, just the people that have, have not rewritten this, but made this remake, have decided to go in a different direction from what we understand. We don't actually know until the the next part is going to be released, and we don't even know when that is. Um, but basically, in the original version, what happens is that this uh, the end of this part is that the group get together at the end at the uh, end of the highway where they escape from uh, the Shinra Tower, and they go out into the open world. And then begins the full open world exploration. In the remake, they've now decided that uh, they've introduced this this mechanic and these things, which are called whispers. Which I guess you could just describe them as cloaks that fly around. They were <laughs> ghosts. I don't really know. And um, they, it was revealed that these are what Red Thirteen describes them as arbiters of fate, and. They're trying to kind of convey that these things interfere, which you do see throughout the the game in the remake, that if something kind of veers off course, they intervene and set the path right. But at the end of this... 
And the path being like what's supposed to happen. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, the original story was what's supposed to happen, what we were expecting, um, <laughs> but that threw everyone for a, a loop. Um, and it happens at the end. You also meet Sephiroth as well. Um, you don't in the original story. You don't meet him till you till no. way later. Yeah. No, no, you, you never. Um, you do encounter him, but you don't encounter him directly. You don't have any kind of uh, fights or battles with him. Uh, Cloud has flashbacks or like, hallucinations and stuff, and you do see him. Um, but but not you don't to... interrupt. You don't fight him. Like, like no. I, it, it seems to me, and this is just the layman talk here. Cause I haven't played the original all the way through yet. I'm, I'm about. I'm just about out of Midgar in my playthrough now of the yeah. original on Switch. Um, but it seems to me like they. It, it feels like I watched Chichen play the very end of it, and it feels like they had to put a boss fight in, and this is their way of like yeah. doing something new and unexpected and cramming a boss fight at the end of part one, so you didn't feel like oh, it's just to be continued. <laughs> yeah, I I totally get that because if it did follow the original story, all it would be was just the gang at the end uh, outside of Midgard, and like okay, well, well there we go in, and like, that's it. Uh, you've never seen the Lord of the Rings, have you? The movies? No, I haven't. No. So in the movies are uh, the, the the ones from like early two thousands are are based on three books and they follow them yeah not a hundred percent but the overarching story is you know adapted pretty pretty faithfully as faithfully as they could and still make it a not twenty five hour movie right <laughs> uh, but at the end of the first film basically they're running away from these orcs and they're the whole movie they've been trying to get to this town and at the end of the first film that the two of them are, are sitting there and they look over the hill and they're like well there's the town we're finally here and then the credits roll <laughs> <gasps> And I had, like, I understood it going in, uh, but I had some friends at the time who were like, what in the hell? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's a very um, apt uh, uh, equivalent. Yeah. yeah. Um, because that is, the first time I played it through, that is exactly what I felt like. And I think you said that Chichen wasn't particularly happy with it either. Yeah, he, he his, uh, uh, the thing that bothered him, I think, was that, it felt shoehorned in, and he also didn't like the fight. He thought the fight was a little, like, not very good, not very engaging. I don't know how it compares to how you fight him at the end of the of the first game. Is it is the combat similar, or is it, is, was this all new, the, the boss fight at the end of uh, the remake? Well, um, obviously quite similar, because the, the original was turn-based, and this one is just free-flow, open yeah. combat, whatever you want to call it. Um, but... Uh... It was very anticlimactic. It, I don't think it was obviously because it's it's such a difficult way to compare the two because there's there's like a vast gap in you know you you leave Midgar and then you, at the very end of the original you fight Sephiroth. So there's the like a huge proportion of but game I, I guess that you're I'm missing. What is the fight at the end of the remake part one? Is it literally that same fight from the end of the original? No. Okay, so you're just fighting him. It's not. It's a setup's all different. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the, yeah. Right. There's a whole different uh, the rest of the story that you have well, to. What, you, yeah, I'm not going to get into that, but yeah. <laughs> With these whispers, I'm thinking like time travel and stuff, but it's more than that, right? It's more like they're there to correct things that are going awry with the yeah. faded timeline. I yeah. I guess as a as like a sci-fi nerd, I love the idea of them like using your expectation of a remake uh, to in a narrative, but. I can't really say that it's done well because I've, I haven't played it. And I know you're a huge fan of the series. And yeah. You, you enjoyed playing it, but you also had your reservations. <laughs> I did, yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, the first time I played it through and I, I finished it, um, the again, probably the same as Chichen, I was like, what? Um, what? What is going on? <laughs> because I, naturally, like, the whole of the, the remake up until the very end point is exactly the same as the original. So I just went into it and I was like, Oh, this is the end. Uh, I know where I am. I'm going down the highway. I'm having a, a fight with a, a rollerball monster machine. And then we'll end. As you then, do. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> casual Friday. And then go out into the world. So for this to be thrown at me completely out of the blue, um, is, it was a bit jarring. Uh, but after like reflecting on it, um, and I, I nearly finished my second playthrough of it because there was some stuff that I missed. Um, I, I kind of had to reason with myself and it is called a, a remake for a reason. And mm -hmm. I kind of can appreciate why they've done this, but it doesn't mean to say that I'm not holding out hope that they will just be like, meh, we'll go back to the original story anyway after this. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, 
I, I, I'm very, very curious to see what they're going to do in the second part. Yeah, it's it's very interesting because uh, I, I think some of the feedback that I've read is that the next one is going to be much more faithful to the story. Like there was an article about it I read on Reddit or somewhere. Yeah, and I'm and I'm like, okay, that's either them going, mm, people weren't crazy about this, let's change what we're doing, or maybe yeah. they never because of the what I understand is to be the more open nature of the second half. Yeah, um, they couldn't mess with it as much. Well, However, this also could just be them setting up your expectation again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Square Enix way. Um, I, again, I because I'm such a huge fan of this, uh, I do or had done a lot of uh, reading. Um, uh-huh. And I, I think I was talking to you about it. Uh, the the guy that was it, uh, was it, is it Nomura? Tetsuya Nomura? I, I don't remember his name for sure, but that sounds sounds uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the name escapes me. I apologize if I got that wrong. But basically, um, the guy that was in charge of um, this remake and the story of the remake um, was also in charge of Kingdom Hearts. And if you've ever played a Kingdom Hearts game, you know how messed up they are. Their timelines are just all over the place. Anyone that can put those games into precise orders, uh, more power to you. <laughs> so there was a big, a big kind of fear um, that uh, he was going to take it the same route with uh, the remake as he had done with Kingdom Hearts and introduce different timelines and possibly time travel and just absolutely mess it up. But there, there is like um, a couple of hints that that may be a possibility with um, the, the group is uh, stood on the edge of the highway after they escape and there's a kind of like a, a flashback-ish to uh, Zack um, who I, it's so hard to describe the story without going very long in that, but basically <laughs> Zach is a very important proponent within the, the story who ends up uh, in the original story, he ends up dying um, he gets uh, ambushed by Shunra guards, uh, Shunra guards and he dies but in the, this little flash that you see, he actually survives it and he picks up Cloud, who they were, were employees together and became friends and they kind of ghost past Ares uh, Aerith, I Hate it being called Aerith as well. Well, call, call her whatever you want. I mean, do they do they change her name for the remake? They, um, oh, this is another talking point as well, probably. But in some, in our case, we got the release with Aerith. Um, but in the original, in the Japanese translated version, it is Aerith. Hmm. So, I don't know why they pronounced it Aerith. It's just one well, of those things. Back back then, there was there were whole teams of um, translators, and they made all kinds of you know decisions or or mistakes that affected what we how we know our characters. Like yeah. I, I um, our friend Shoyu is Japanese, um, and he he played he grew up or spent some time in Japan when he was younger. So whenever I talk about Mega Man, he gets all been out of shape because over there it's called Rock Man. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean anything against <laughs> Mega Man or Rock Man. Yeah. I just never heard of him before. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that that comes to mind actually with the 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 whole Aerith Aerith thing is that the one thing that stood out to me instantly was that they call it Marco. I have n- no one that I know that knows Final Fantasy pronounced it Marco. Yeah, but it's the, the, the voiceover it's it's Mako or it's Marco, right? But then again, me reasoning with myself. And um, also because I've been listening to a lot of uh, Japanese music lately as well. Yeah, if you ba- listen to baby metal, yeah, yeah, nice. Uh, I love that band. Um, <laughs> if you listen to the Japanese dialect and how they pronounce the A's, it is true to form. Like yeah. the A's are pronounced as R, so I guess the Marco would kind of make sense. But isn't it funny how uh, how you get used to calling something something and, and it, your brain just like no, yeah. no, don't let it. <laughs> Yeah, it's so weird because like this is obviously the first time that we've ever had any uh, voice acting in Final Fantasy VII. So, well, yeah. it's got sort of like how you and I go by our Twitch names here on the podcast. And if I were to call you by your real name, you'd be like, "What the hell are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. But so, as an objective fan of the original, um, are you overall happy with the remake? Uh, despite some of the things that you've had a problem with, or uh, have you come around after your first and uh, your initial like uncomfortableness with how much they changed? Um, I was overwhelmingly happy when I first booted it up and started playing. I was like, this is my, how old would I be? 13, 12? 
maybe younger, 11 <laughs> year old self. Know. Um, just absolutely love the utter hell out. I still do love this remake. Um, and yeah, after getting over the, the kind of I don't know, disgruntledness, but shock, I guess, of the yeah. end, um, I absolutely love it. I, 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 I very, very rarely replay games and this has just absolutely got me by, by the horns and I'm, I'm like I said, nearly through my second playthrough. So yeah. And now all you win. want is for the second one to come out. Oh my God. Yeah. How long, how long do you think it's going to be till that happens? I don't know. My only concern <laughs> with that is that, um, obviously with the next generation of consoles coming out, um, I do hope that they keep in mind that not everyone can be able to afford a PS5. So I hope that they do develop it with the PS4 in mind so other people can still get it. I heard a, a, uh, either a, a rumor or a leak or something like that, that the, the, uh, PS5 is going to cost around four hundred fifty dollars at launch, mm. which would be probably three fifty to four hundred pounds. Yeah. It's it's probably sounds about right. I guess it's like a slight. What would the PS4 was like three hundred? Was it? It's, well, yeah, no, yeah sorry. I think so. was it three hundred? I think it was three fifty when it launched, but they I think they dropped it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm not going to buy one on launch day unless there's just a kill. Like the only thing that would make me buy one is if there is some unknown thing comes out that I know I have to have, like a Bloodborne two, yeah. or uh, I'll wait till there's a killer app that I want. I won't buy it on launch day. Like yeah, I used to for the last you know ever. I'd buy. A, I'd usually buy a console on launch day because I'm a huge gamer nerd and I love playing that kind of stuff. And yeah, um, I I I think the PS3 I bought later. Um, <laughs> you mean the worst console in history? The one that turns out to be like a bread bin. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. There were some good games on it. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I. It was funny because um, do you, <laughs> here's how old I am. Do you remember the big projection TVs that sat on the floor and they were like five foot wide by three feet deep? Did you guys Ooh. ever have one of those growing up? I didn't. No. Okay, so they, it, it, I don't know. If, I'm sure you guys had them there, but Probably. they had these. Like what we call a giant, like fifty-five inch widescreen TV. They had them before widescreens were. Or plasma was the first TV that came out here, but yeah. um, I had one and I had it for a few years. Um, and then when I was going to get a flat screen, like the one that you hung on the wall, I I sold this one on uh, like Craigslist here. And the guy showed up and he's like, um, "Would you be?" He, I don't even remember how much I was selling it for. He goes, "Would you be interested in if in taking a PS3 as partial trade?" And I'm like, because uh, he saw I had like three consoles. So <laughs> I go, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would. And he he basically gave it to me for the equivalent of $150, which is like half off at the time. Wow, so yeah, probably all it's like, anyway. Well, at the time, it was pretty new. It had been out for maybe a year. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, oh, this is probably sorry. stolen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pawning you off. Yeah. Mm. But it, it, I, 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 I wish I wouldn't have sold that console because there's a lot of games that were like only on that console that you can't yeah. get anywhere else. but. I do you remember um, uh, an old boyfriend of mine had a PS3, and I remember being absolutely infatuated with him playing a Heavy Rain. Mm, yeah. And at the time, like it, I, I'd never seen anything that sort of uh, genre of game before. So, yeah. Did you ever it, play it? Uh, no, no, I never played it. No. It, it it is available for PC, but it's on the Epic Store. I'll pass. <laughs> it probably doesn't hold up too well, anyway. And plus, yeah, I, I would know. just I, I would. Throughout the game, I'd just be shouting, uh, oh, crud, what's the, what's the kid's name? Jason! That's it. Yeah. That's where I stopped playing that game. Yeah. So whenever that game came out, I had like a, a young daughter at the time. She maybe, maybe wasn't even two years old. And the, if you've never played it, the game opens up with this guy like going through his normal day. And then he's a dad of two kids. Mm. And he loses one of his kids in the crowd and he gets hit by a car or something like that. Gets yeah. killed. He's got the balloon. And you start following the wrong balloon, and all of a sudden he's dead. Uh, Dee and I were watching it, and she's like, uh, "Yeah, I think I'm done watching this." Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is, but after you have a kid, like some, sometimes it's harder to watch stuff oh, involving children. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> it reminds me. I may have even told the story on the podcast before, so apologize if I have. But when, um, right after our daughter was born, uh, my wife Dee and I went when uh, we finally like the first time we went out like on a on a babyless date, we we had D had a hard time letting anybody watch 
uh, our mm-hmm. kid. So we took her over to my sister-in-law's house who watched her for a couple hours, went to dinner and knew a movie. And we watched Pan's Labyrinth. Have you ever seen that oh, movie? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> there's wow. Scene, there's like a monster in the middle of it that like eats a baby. Yeah. And, and he's like, I don't want to watch the rest of this. And I was like, we paid like $20 to see this movie. We're watching it to the credits. <laughs> To be fair, it's quite a good film. It's just a bit freaky. Oh, it is. It's just like the absolute. Like if you have a stay-at-home mom who's like having a real hard time letting go of their kid yeah. outside of, it's the worst movie to watch <laughs> <laughs> for that person. But uh, it, it's a great film. Yeah. So, anything else on uh, Final Fantasy remake that we did, that we need to talk about? Uh, I, don't I mean, I know, I know you could go for another yeah, hour and a half, but I really could. But um. No, I think if um, if you haven't played the original, even if you have played the original, definitely go and just give it a, a try. It's um, I love this is probably just my nostalgia kicking in, but I love the characters in this game. I love the story in this game. I love the setting in this game. Everything about this is just like my dream come true. Also, I will give props to whoever cast the voice actors in this because they have absolutely nailed the voices in what I would imagine them sounding like, which is, is just a feat in itself. <laughs> who who is the, the 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 big guy with the gun for a hand? Is his name Barrett? Barrett. Yeah. Uh, he he's like the first guy you hear talk a lot when you first play the game. I I, yeah. I got the demo on the PS4 um back before D decided she wanted it. Yeah. Um and I played through that demo and just <laughs> <laughs> he would just yell and have all these like eighties, nineties cliche action uh, movie lines. Like, yeah, he, he would tell robots to suck it, and I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> and and yeah. I was surprised how like we we talked about this the other day about a couple different you know movies and anime and video games how we played these games as children and we didn't pick up on some of the subtle stuff mm. that was a little bit more adult and like final fantasy when, when um, I'm playing through the original and I watched cherry or, or D was streaming it went through this part where they go to basically a whorehouse. Oh and, God. Yeah. And they're like all in imminent danger of being raped or killed. And, yep. and it's like, as a kid, you play through that and you're like, Oh, they're just going on a zany fun adventure. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, that's just an a woman. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah. And it, it, it's like the culture difference, you know, like yeah. it's a common thing in animes where the, the male lead, I, I can't say common. I've seen it in some animes and some movies where they they have very feminine or male characters go dress up very feminine. And I've seen that in American stuff too. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. it just seems like a trope that you, that you see a bit more in the Japanese culture. And um, this, uh, or not the culture in the, in the movies and their entertainment, but the, um, the, I remember playing the the original one, which was came out in like the mid to late nineties mm-hmm. uh, on Switch, and I'm like, he the who's the 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 lead guy at the at the whorehouse? What's his name? The the creepy bald dude. Oh, that, Don Canal. Yeah, he he basically picks one of three of these these applicants and like just chucks the version I played. Through, he just t- chucks Tifa. To to his lackeys, she's yep. all yours, boys. Yep. I'm like, oh, Jesus, this is dark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like again, we, I think this is what we were talking about the other day as well with um, adult themes that I never picked up on as a kid, and it was it didn't occur to me recently. Um, I think I mentioned this to you as well. If you're a fan of the original uh, Final Fantasy VII, there is um, a series on YouTube which mm-hmm. is called Final Fantasy VII Machine Abridged. I think, and it's basically it's just a parody. It's all the uh, kind of cutscenes from uh, Final Fantasy VII, but redubbed. So like, it's got a lot of comedy in it and stuff. And there was one scene in particular, which is in the remake as well, where you go to Professor Hojo's uh, lab, which is in the Shinra Tower. Yeah, and he's he's captured Aerith, and uh, you meet Red Thirteen there. Didn't That's where I am know- in the original, right? Now. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> or just past that, I should say. Yeah, um, it didn't register with me up until I watched Machine Bridge that <laughs> he was planning to breed those two together. Yeah, the, the dog and the and the woman. Who, the and dog Aerith, is yeah. like some like alien from another dimension or something. Yeah. And and Aerith is a I guess also like I get the idea she's an ancient one or some kind of like otherworldly creature, but that takes she's, a human form. She's a descendant of um what they call the ancients, which is also called the Cetras. Um mm-hmm. so she's not completely like she's not a full uh full blooded ancient but she's like half so i think that's the the yeah. reasoning behind hojo's wanting to breed the two so you it's, take two halves make a whole 
Yeah, so I, I, I'm not far enough in the story where I know what's going on, but I'm, they're like starting to drop those breadcrumbs about how she's an ancient from a, maybe another world or another dimension. I don't know yet. Uh, no, they're from the same planet. They're just um, the original. It's like Adam and Eve. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Then well, they, it, it, does it actually explain to you, Crunk, uh, in, the, in the remake, it gives you a nice bit of history uh, lesson uh, about it and um, uh, tells you that the Cetra were the original um people that were on this earth in inverted commas um they were the ones that were able to harness the i think it was the live stream or mako mako Mako. sorry mako and they were the ones that uh actually created materia oh okay so who is red 13 has it ever said where he's from is he an ancient creature that's also also always been here or is he from somewhere else that one um you'll have to wait until you play the rest of the original because it's not divulged in the remake of very little is said about red 13 in this one because you're um, not through it's more fleshed out in the second half i guess yeah yeah my my memory of cosmo canyon and where he's from is is very hazy because it's quite further on in the game all right i, I can hear the fans right now that, that know all this information going what the hell you guys don't even know this game <laughs> you call yourself fans <laughs> Well, I'm sure we're going to talk. We're going to re uh, approach the Final Fantasy again when it comes out. Of the the next part comes out, but yeah, the uh, the game that I finished up here lately was um, longtime listeners probably heard me talk about um, Xenoblade Chronicles Two that came out on the Switch close to launch, maybe a month or so in the launch of Switch. I played a good 120 hours of it <laughs> back then, and. I stopped streaming it because it was putting off viewership because it's slow or JRPG and not a lot of people know about it or care about it. And I also got tired of getting called a misogynist pig because all the characters (laughs) in it are, speaking of Japanese culture, all the characters in it are like hyper-sexualized. Like the girls all are like tall, skinny with big boobs and all this stuff and (laughs) half naked. And um, so I I finally, with the... Xenoblade 1 Definitive Edition, or basically the remaster, coming out at the end of this month. I'm like, you know what? I, I know a little bit about the end of the story. Like, one night on YouTube, I just watched all the cutscenes. Mm. And then I thought, you know what? I can get back into this. I can finish it. And I think I put another 30 to 40 hours into it wow. and finished the story. And um, I'm not going to say anything spoilery because the def- I want if you're listening to this and you like JRPGs and you've never played Xenoblade Chronicles and you have a Switch, that's a lot of ands, but um, <laughs> keep an eye out for it. Um, it's it's published by Nintendo, so it's not going to ever come down in price. You, you should go ahead and buy it on day one. Um, <laughs> wow. Z- seriously, Xenoblade, there. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 right now is still $60 in the shop and it came out two years ago. Um, but the Definitive Edition is going to come out and it's – I won't say it's the best game I've ever played uh, or the best story I've ever seen because I, I like my opinion on those things change too often. Like I always say, I always used to say Ocarina of Time is my favorite, one of the best gameplay experiences I've had of all time, but sort of like Final Fantasy VII, it's hard to recommend a game that old now because yeah. you there are a lot of things to put you off with visuals and the controls and everything. You know, that those games came out back when the 3d era really began and they were still figuring out how to like make things look good and play well. And, mm-hmm. um, that are you kind of take for granted now that, Oh, camera moves with the right stick. Well, those consoles didn't have a right stick. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the camera didn't even move. Exactly. Well, in final fantasy, it didn't in yeah. Zelda. Uh, you pushed the Z button underneath the left trigger to, z- z- uh, zero the camera in behind Link, yeah. and then you use the C buttons to look around, sort of like Mario. It, and it was great at the time, but you know, there's they've refined it a lot. But um, I finished that game, and man, w- does it do a really good job of uh, tying in its story to Xenoblade One. Like you play Xenoblade Two all the way through to like the last ten hours before you realize how it ties in, and wow. it does some super amazing stuff that I, I don't want to spoil. But um, I. I would. You definitely should play Xenoblade Chronicles one first if you are planning on playing them both. You don't have to. Like you could play Xeno two and never know anything other than the, the story will not have the extra connection that that you would get if you played one first. But you don't yeah. need it to enjoy it and have a satisfying ending. Yeah. Um. So is it the first one that they're planning release of? Yeah. This yeah. Uh, end of this month. Yeah, the 29th. And it's way less um, pervy and over-sexualized. Um, what's what's like, different about this remake? Oh, not remake, but 
what it is, is a it remake. Mean? They're calling it a definitive edition. So okay. So here's the I mean the short story version of the story is Xenoblade is a is made by a couple of former employees that got married from Square. And they they worked on like Final Fantasy VI. They they were the the wife I think wrote the stories and did some of the artwork, and the husband also was involved in both those. And they they went off to form their own company um, called Monolith Soft maybe fifteen years ago. Hmm. And they put out back before they left though they made these games called Xeno Gears and Xeno Saga for the PS One, and I think one of them was on the PS Two. Don't quote me on that, but I've never played those. Hmm. Um, and then they they put out for the Switch. They got an exclusive deal with Nintendo because Nintendo was like said, "Hey, why don't you become like a, the term second party developer?" Where they're, they 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 go in like with a publishing deal with Nintendo. Nintendo is a part ownership of their company, um, and they they um, <clears throat> they put out some ports for Nintendo. They ported some games out. They made some 3DS games and, and DS Lite games when they first got or. I think they're just 3DS games. Mm. And then they made this game called, um, that was Japan only, called Xenoblade Chronicles. And because they couldn't use any of the past IPs that were registered in, as Sony games uh, or, or Squaresoft games, Xeno Gears and Xeno Saga, they just made it a spiritual successor called the Xenoblade Chronicles with some homages in it, but nothing you know that would get them in trouble legally. Yeah. And there were, there were two or three big JRPGs during that, during the the Wii era, 2007, 2008, that people like petitioned Nintendo of America, Nintendo of Europe petitioned uh, Nintendo of Japan to release them. And what they did was they did a fundraiser where they, it was basically like a, uh, like a, what would they call, call it when a company pre-sells a game on yeah. a, what is that? It's like a Kickstarter. They did basically a, a Kickstarter before it was a thing. They they did this big um, campaign on Twitter and email campaign and had all these you know people sign up and it took them like a year and a half. But they they pulled the trigger. Then it took them maybe three years from the time it came out in Japan to port it to America and and in Europe and have it translated. And by the time it because it took them so long to make it, I think it was originally supposed to be a PS2 game. It uh-huh. took them took them forever to make the game and by the time they got it out in in Japan it was on the P or it was on the Wii the original Wii and they had to downscale all the graphics and they had to, it, it didn't look really great yeah uh, and when it when it came to America it was in real limited supply and they there was only one production run ran of it and it became a huge collector's item because People who knew about it uh, that had already pre-bought it got it, and then there was this limited shelf space set up for it. And some cunning uh, asshole at GameStop <laughs> in America said, "You know what? We should purchase the digital rights or the uh, printing rights to this, pay to reprint it, and then selling it selling it used because the used market for this game was going up to like a hundred dollars." What? Yeah, because it was real limited supply and everybody bought it that wanted it. And then and then word of mouth spread that, whoa, this is a, like a hidden gem of a game. And so everyone bought all the copies up and there were no and there was no pressing deal to print any more of them. So GameStop bought the rights to print it. And then what, instead of selling it new for $60 in their store, like like everyone assumed that what they would do, they bought it, pr- printed them, and just didn't shrink wrap them. Stuck a used sticker on them for $100 and put it on their shelves. Oh, God. <laughs> Which, you know, is an asshole move to make anti consumer, but it's if they can legally do it, it's smart of them as a company to try to pull that off. But did it work? So, um yeah, people bought it. Well, it, here's what happened. I I um I heard about this story on like a podcast or on maybe on IGN on YouTube. I don't even remember how I heard about it, but it was like gaming news at the time when it got figured out that what they had done because shitting on GameStop in America is a huge way to get clicks <laughs> for your for your gaming news, right? So uh, yeah. So uh, what happened was I was at a uh, like a not a GameStop but like a local resale shop that's down the street from where I work, and they had one sitting there for I think forty forty dollars. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to see what this is all about because this is probably five, no, five years ago, probably. This game came out in America 10 years ago and it was, it had been started being made 
maybe even a decade before that. So when when I got the game home, the first thing you notice was, geez, this game looks like it's 20 years old. I mean, <laughs> it looks like a PS1, PS2 era game with like jaggies and really yeah. bad, like low polygon characters. And <clears throat> I played it and my first impressions were, I feel like I'm playing a PS2 game, but <laughs> I was in the, you know, sometimes you got to be in the right mood for a particular genre, a slow JRPG. And it, I don't want to say any spoilers because I really hope people check it out when it comes out on Switch. But basically, in the first 30 minutes, there's a major, like, there's a call to action. It's, it's basically about these two, these two, um, giant, there's a, 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 a human being giant called Titan and a, and a machine one called, um, the Mechonis is the machine and the Bionis is the living creature. And they're locked in this like battle in the clouds. And that's mm-hmm. all you see. There's like an opening shot of these guys fighting and they both suffer um, like fatal wounds and they're, they're, they freeze that way. And they're frozen in time with like a sword stuck through one and like a hammer in the shoulder of another. And what happens in the story is there are these, like creatures that are like the size of an ant to these Titans that are living on them. And so they live on the world uh, of the machine and the Bionis, which is the, you know, the, the living life form. Yeah. And what the uh, race of looks like humans um, called the Homs grow on the bio- Bionis and the Mechons grow up on the, on the, um, the Mechonis. So, there's these the machines decided that the humans are a threat and they go raiding and like blowing up their towns and you you play as Shulk who is in Street Fighter you most or not Street Fighter but uh Smash Brothers most people know Shulk from there because they've never played <laughs> never uh. played Xenoblade but so he he's a scavenger and a salvager and he's he's grabbing you open the game playing as him and he's like taking parts back and um while while he's back at home you learn about the sword that was the only sword that can destroy the mech on and, but it hurts the person holding it. And, mm. the, and basically during that opening scene where you're meeting everybody and learning about the world, you're attacked by the Bionis and, um, some major event happens. I, I'm not going to say who, but somebody really important to the story gets murdered. <laughs> oh, like, and that was the inciting incident. Like it really hooked me. Uh, quickly and the story is really good it's got its own charms that if you just saw a video of it uh, there's a character called a napon who's like a little little furry like ball that can fight um there are there are a race of organisms on there and they talk like with this really like childlike dialogue their dialect yeah. so if, if you if you're not bought of the story you'd be like what the fuck are these guys and if you go <laughs> if you go watch any reviews it's like the one con everybody lists but i, I love them i love the no pod i think they're awesome <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i'm planning on streaming that game exclusively when it comes out here in a couple of weeks um because i want people to see it and um what i loved it for it's pretty you know us against the world story and the they have this system where you have to like build the relationships between your characters. Mm -hmm. And if you keep doing these things that do that, you'll find areas later in the game. They call them heart to heart moments that flesh out the story. But both those characters have to have a relationship level so high or you can't do it. And it, it has all these carrot on a stick things that keep you like invested. And Xenoblade two goes even a far step further, but like all the, the systems, the, the, Weapon, the weapon crafting, or not crafting, but the the weapon building arts that you learn, sort of like uh, if you've ever played an MMO, you you know you you have a level one version of a spell. Oh, if you level it up high enough, you can get the level ten version of it. It's a little more yeah. damage. All that, the character, uh, the story, it's all tied together in a way that I've never seen done as well as this, as in Xenoblade Chronicles one and two, and it it makes the world feel more alive. It makes the characters feel more special. Like, and, and it's a game that's not afraid to just straight up kill people off. So like you get really attached to a character and then all of a sudden they're like, Oh, they're dead. Oh, now they're back. Now they're back, but they're not the same. And now they're <laughs> gone. And, and now they're the enemy. And, 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 and then it unfolds in, it culminates in a science fiction type ending that blew my mind. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm going to say something that's not really a spoiler, but when you get to the end, Shulk meets himself and him and Shulk is the final boss. 
Okay. <laughs> that's, that's all I can say without being too spoilery, but it has this, uh, and, and the way they, they dovetailed Xenoblade Chronicle 2 story in with this whole, you know, heady concept at the end is like nothing I've ever seen before or since. I'm sure there's been like sci-fi novels that touch this, but it's cause it's kind of a heady concept, but the way they, the way they transition the story from like, you know, almost fantasy to sci-fi is something that, that usually doesn't get meshed well together. I think Star Wars is a perfect example of a what – if you ask somebody whether whether uh, Star Wars is sci-fi or not, most people will say, yeah. But it's more, it's more um, you know, uh, fantasy because – You've got space wizards that can move things with their mind and magical lightsabers that couldn't exist in real life. You know what I mean? True. So uh, that, that's that's both the what I've what I've been playing to get caught up. Uh, other than and I've also been playing Final Fantasy VII and a couple trying out games here and there. But I'm really just counting down the days till <laughs> till Xenoblade Remaster or Definitive Edition comes out. And also when Xenoblade came out, they kind of they they rushed it. There was one part of the game that was when when you. It's sort of like uh, – I, I forgot to mention this. Monolith Soft made a, a Xenoblade game between 1 and 2 called Xenoblade Chronicles X that was on the Wii U. Mm. And it was less of a story-based game and more of an open-world, like, do-all-the-things game. But it was a massive world. And you, you've got mechs that you could fly around in later in the game. Monolith Soft helped Nintendo um, with the – coding of breath of the wild to make it a one to make it as big as it was and how you could just go anywhere without loading um and that's one of those things that nintendo took a chance on them 15 years ago and it paid off in, in games like breath of the wild one and two i thought that yeah. was kind of a new thing but um but that's really where i've been uh, gaming wise i'm i'm looking forward to that and um one thing that we saw this week wasn't it um mario paint the, the origami king uh yeah. Mario, uh, Paper Mario. Paper Mario. I said Mario Paint. And I-, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. Wait, what are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, Mario yeah. Paint. Uh, no, you got, got me calling it Mario Paint now. Paper Mario. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So, have you have you ever, what's the last Paper Mario game you play? Or, yeah, Paper Mario game. Yeah, I know. So, we just call it Mario Paint. Um, <laughs> I think we were talking about this off stream, off uh, yeah. podcast. Um the one and only one that I've ever played was, I think, just the the first one. I think it was just called Paper Mario. Oh, okay. Thousand yeah. Year Door? No, no, it's no, a that separate a one. A Thousand Year Door is a different one. Okay. Because um, I do remember looking into this and uh, the Thousand Year Door to get the original uh, cartridge. Was mm-hmm. it for the N64? Was it for I'll the- take your word on that one. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry, everyone out there who knows about this. Um, but... I think it was anyway. In order to get the original game itself, it they run in the hundreds to oh, actually wow. purchase it. Yeah, it's a for some reason the Thousand Year Door is a really rare game to have, and I don't know why. But Nintendo. All I know about the Paper Mario series uh, is they th- there's a Wii one called Super Paper Mario where where it's more you could like flip it on its side like in the 3D, um, and then the, everyone hated Sticker Star. <laughs> Why? Did you ever play that one? Mm-mm. Yeah, people hated it. For I guess it was like it went. It was more kitty, and it didn't have the same mechanics as the other ones had. And yeah. they they were supposed to get back with that with the, on the Wii U with uh, Color Splash. I think it was called. Yes. Yeah. And I, here's all I know about that game. My daughter played it for a while. She says it's kind of stupid. <laughs> <laughs> And she well, was like 11 at the time. So it's like, <laughs> if, you, if, if you can't capture an 11-year-old's attention with a Mario, pa- uh, Mario Paper Mario game, I don't know what yeah, you're thinking. There's something wrong, yeah. I do remember I'd never played uh, a Paper Mario before I played the original one. And I went into it thinking, I was like, oh, this is going to be cool. This is be like uh, Mario's just paper thin. It'll be like a, a, a just a, a typical adventure platforming game, like a Mario mm-hmm. style, style game. And then when it turned out to be like a, a turn-based, like a RPG kind of uh, game, it wasn't what I was expecting, but I didn't dislike it. Yeah, I, I could agree with that. I, I think that's what people want is that 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 Paper Mario was kind of a harken back to the Mario RPG on the SNES. Yeah, and there people have a lot of like 
really fond memories of that game. I still I played it late, and I don't think it holds up. I think it's kind of a it's not a good Mario game, and it's not a great RPG either. <laughs> it's kind of like a. I, I think what it did really well is when you do the attacks, you know, you select your attack and who you're going to hit. There was a there was a mechanic where you could like hit the button right as. Right as, as Mario hit something. So, like, there, it was more engaging than your typical turn-based RPG. Yeah. Yeah. I think, they, did they do that in Paper Mario as well? Yeah, they did. Paper mm. Mario and um, had it, and so did, like, some of the 3DS games, like Bowser's Inside Story had it a, a bit. Uh, uh, you know, those, 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 those uh, R- Mario RPG was actually made by Squaresoft. Um, oh, no way. They, yeah, Nintendo licensed them to do it, and they really haven't gotten back to that formula. I, I, mm. I don't know if there is a... Uh, market for it anymore all the modern rpgs they've they've taken away turn-based combat because i think the consensus is a lot of people don't like it anymore yeah i think yeah times have, have evolved and changed obviously so these damn kids ruining everything. <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> there's plenty of turn-based rpgs out there if you look hard enough but yeah uh, i think the best thing about the paper mario news is that it's one of like four of the rumors that came out uh coming to fruition one of the rumors is that there's going to be a mario 64 mario uh what's the one on the island uh it's the one that came out on the on the gamecube on the island yeah where he he has the the water hose on the on top of, oh sunshine oh, sunshine yeah oh. uh, mario sunshine and then mario galaxy um are going to come out on all on one disc like an all-stars 3d all-stars kind of uh Disc. Now, question about that. Obviously, I'm, I'm assuming you don't really know, but I'd be curious to see yeah. Yeah, if they are just going to port it or if they're going to do something else with it. The rumor was they're gonna get they're gonna get either remastered or upresed or something like that. I don't know if they're gonna like completely remake everything or touch up any gameplay or control issues um, because the rumors haven't been confirmed. But that that. The uh, Paper Mario, new Paper Mario game, was part of that rumor package that came out with all this other stuff. So, um, if if nothing was confirmed, it would be less you know exciting than well. One of the things that they leaked that got leaked appears to be true. So hopefully these yeah. come out. Yeah, I, the one thing I do like about Nintendo is that they just just drop these games when you least <laughs> expect it. Yeah, that game comes out in like July. The Paper Mario one yeah. does, and it, there's no like. Like preconceptions or hype or anything about it. It's just there you go. Have that. <laughs> oh, Bye. was it the uh, the Mario Maker two? Uh, oh god, update? yeah, yeah. <laughs> just hey, by the way, we updated it and put all kinds of shit in the game. Yeah. It's downloading now. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I do. I still remember. Well, it was it. Um, was it the direct that they did like last year when they like originally announced the Mario Maker two? Mm-hmm. Um and. Oh God, I I still remember my reaction to that being announced. I'm like, absolutely blown away. Yeah, you were giddy. You were like messaged me at four in the morning. Did you see it? I'm like, I'm not even out of bed yet. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, are there any other th- games that you've been looking forward to this year? I think uh, we talked about this the other day, and I don't think you had anything. Man, anything come up on your radar? No, um, I did mention to you that I'm still waiting on a release date for Silk Song, which is the sequel to uh, Hollow Knight. Mm, yeah. Um, but nothing else has been revealed or said about it, unfortunately, since last year, last year's E3. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, but for some reason, I, I would, I get the feeling that if E3 had gone ahead this year, they would have had something to say, but. Yeah, nothing, nothing concrete, unfortunately. Yeah, and they're a small development team too. Team Cherry, yeah. I don't know if that helps them or hurts them in getting something out this or working on stuff during this lockdown yeah. stuff. But well, the reason that I, I I feel like it should be or is going to be released this year is that when they showed the the gameplay last year at E3, it seemed quite um, I don't want to say finished, but very polished. Right. Um, for it to to be announced and and for it to not be released this year i think would i think would be a missed opportunity for them if they can do that <laughs> talking about uh lack of polish or, or polished or lack of polish in video games i got an email today from uh city state gaming which uh is the 
reborn development house that made Dark Age of Camelot back in the late 90s, early 2000s. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And wow. if you've never heard the term vaporware, it's basically a game that's never going to come out. <laughs> but they, they keep putting out these publications and these YouTube updates every week. And it's been like, I, I think I, 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 this is a thing I will rarely admit to, but I, I bought this on Kickstarter. I Kickstarted it for $60 because um, of all the fun I had with the original way back. I thought if they modernize that and make it a new game, uh, I'll give it a, I'll give it a try for 60 bucks. I'll try that out. And, that was like four years ago I paid for that. It's so <laughs> Every time you log into their YouTube channel, it's like they're working on like animations of those characters' legs. Oh and they have these these closed beta events. And if you if you put $60 down, you can join. I joined one day and it was just people running around talking. I'm like, what, what, is, what are we doing here? And they're like, we're just running around on this geometry talking to each other. I'm like, this is not – this game is not even more close to me, right? <laughs> It's just one, you know. It's just going to be one massive troll, and be like, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna release this um, in a bit, maybe." Well, what they did, they they um, maybe a couple of months ago, they released a mobile game. The same development company did, and they like had to go out of the way to say none of the Kickstarter money went into making this game. None of our assets or labor went into making this game, but we had to get this game out the door to have more money to finish making our big game. And I'm like, oh, God, yikes! Like, yeah. If you ever want to have a good laugh, ask D about it. <laughs> it's okay. called the game's called Camelot Unchained. <laughs> and if you want to talk to her, she gets real pissed about it. She goes, "That game is never coming out." <laughs> oh, well, does she want it to come out? Oh, I, I bet she would play it. She'd give it a shot anyway. Oh, but you know, it's that's how it is. Well, guys, thank you so much for getting uh, caught up with us. Uh, we're going to try to get more episodes out. We're also going to have uh, more guests. Uh, on because like Cherry said sometimes we have a hard time with timing getting everything out so to kind of keep keep from having gaps at the release schedule we're going to have some, some special guests on and uh, um, I think Cherry can cover all the British folks and I can ca- cover all the American folks when we have them on <laughs> oh, well, yeah certainly hope <laughs> not so. just British but European <laughs> no just the British people <laughs> <laughs> Cherry's going to start her own British gaming <laughs> podcast for and by British folks <laughs> yeah but, uh, <laughs> well ch- are you there? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, Cherry. No problem, man. Thanks for uh, catching up with me again. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.